And of course, I sustained a, a back injury carrying load. Um, my wife, when she was in the Air Force, they used to call her the pack with legs. She sustained a hip injury, which required surgery from carrying load. My daughter, when she joined the Air Force, she had a, a, a lower back injury from carrying load. My brother-in-law, when he was going across for SF selection, did a knee injury and required surgery from carrying load. But the good news is my nephew, who's 26 and who's in the 5th Battalion, he hasn't had a back injury or any injury yet carrying load, but you know, he's young, give him time. So load carriage is important to me. Um, as an infantry soldier, obviously I had to carry the load, but then I became a physical training instructor where I was required to teach others to carry load. And then as a physiotherapist, I was required to treat those that we'd broken carrying load. So I've got to see it from a multiple uh, bunch of angles, which is why I've got the sort of love-hate relationship with load carriage. So when we look at load carriage itself, some of the stuff, uh, the bottom line up front, with all the information we're presenting today, is a, a well-structured and well-periodized load carriage program um, can reduce the negative impacts of carrying occupational loads. The only way we'll get rid of the impacts of carrying occupational load is, will be to get rid of the load. And research has shown that after, over the last three millennia, our loads aren't uh, going anywhere quickly, but they're actually probably going up. All right, so 3,000 years of uh, load carriage history in soldiers going back to the 800 BC Assyrian spearmen, and our loads are still increasing. So the nature of warfare may change, the nature of weaponry we carry may change, our alliances may change, but our loads seems to keep going up. So for tactical operators, look, you've got to carry load. And, and that's the short of it. They've got to carry load um, for both sustainability in the field for, and for protection and to in increase operational uh, capability. Carrying these loads will place them at risk of both uh, reducing task performance, which is one of the key things I want to look at. We know that the fact that it can cause injuries, but for me, even more important than task performance is the impact it has on, uh, sorry, more important than injuries, the impact it has on task performance. This is one of my favorite quotes that I came across from a uh, US Army soldier wounded in Afghanistan. When you get shot at, you move as fast as you can, but it wasn't very fast, you're just so tired. You know, so he realized he was being shot at in the interview, but he just physically could not get out of the way in time. And when we look at some of the research on the impact of load carriage on mobility, it's, it really becomes quite scary, particularly for those of you that are on the dark side and uh, you're down and dirty in the weeds and your boots are on the ground. When you have a look at some of the science behind this, um, it's a bit chilling. So we know about injuries, and it can cause a whole plethora of injuries from your little you know, blisters, which everybody thinks our blister's not a big deal, but research has shown that once you have a blister, you change your gait mechanics. So you're walking along on a 15K stomp, and at about 5Ks, you start to feel that nice little heat spot, you know, that little niggle in the toe. It gets warmer and warmer and warmer. So what your body does, it says, well, I'm not going to put any more load through that toe because it's got a heat spot. It's telling me there's a, there's a problem. So we're going to change how you walk to protect that area. And then lo and behold, they end up with a knee injury or back injury or some other form of injury because they've changed their gait mechanics. Likewise, uh, a couple of years ago in the Australian Defence Force, we had a whole bunch of recruits admitted to hospital because their blisters actually went septic. So they had to be admitted to hospital and go into IVs because these simple little blisters from load carriage went septic whilst they're out field. So even simple little things like blisters can have a huge impact on your force sustainment. But then you get your more nasty things like your ligament and tendon bone injuries, all the way up to your neuropraxias. So I remember <laughs> um, we were doing a, an exercise and I was the, the, the field physiotherapist and the platoon sergeant was yelling at this one kid to get up and move because they were doing a, a tactical assault and this kid couldn't physically get up off the ground and he was lying in this prone position, his weapon was out in front of him and we were just walking along behind uh, having a good chat as the of staff can do, you know, it's great fun because you don't get shot, you're, you're invisible when you're director of staff and this platoon sergeant was hooking into this young guy, get up, get up, get up and eventually they went over and saw him and he sort of half rolled over and he said, I can't, I can't get up and he said, what do you mean you can't get up? He said, I can't, my hands have gone numb. And it was actually, uh, when they you know, took him back through medical and we actually tested him, he had both arms, had a brachial plexus palsy. So he had neurological injuries to both arms from carrying his load. The load was so heavy that it compressed in the scapula and actually shut off nervous supply to his hands. So he was actually eventually discharged after 18 months of rehabilitation and surgery to both his left and right brachial plexus. We couldn't fix him and we lost that soldier during recruiting. So all that raise, train and sustain went down the hill. Um, so yeah, injuries themselves can have this huge impact. But as I said, one of the key things for me is the impact it has on performance. 
So firstly, let's look at how it impacts on performance. One of the key areas that it impacts on is your mobility. So the speed at which you move. Research has shown that in wilderness firefighters, it decreases the amount of time they have to negotiate an escape route. This was our last Australian fire season at the beginning of the year. The firestorm was clocked at between 31 and 37 miles per hour. That's how fast a firestorm was moving across the brush. So if you're a wilderness firefighter and you've got to get away from that, every second counts. Anything that slows you down is going to cost you your life. Now the impacts of load, of load on mobility are not new. As I said, we've gone back to about 800 BC and looked at the Assyrian spearmen. The Assyrians were actually experimenting on their shield weight because they realized that the weight of their shield was decreasing their mobility in an advance. So through history, we've known that it's impacted on the ability to fight. In, oh, we've got Lothian. Lothian did some research on World War I and he found that the impact of load carriage on uh, the British and Australian forces or the, the Australian Imperial Force was so great that it changed the tactics of war by reducing the amount of distance that the Allied forces could move per day. It reduced from around 15 kilometers to around 9 kilometers per day. So it changed the tactics of the war because they were being slowed down by the loads they were carrying. In 1980, Slam Marshall released a book on uh, The Soldier's Load and Mobility of a Nation, which is a US book, which is a very interesting read. And he's got a lot of anecdotes and, and stories and even letters from um, uh, a Canadian colonel by the name of Greer on the impact it has on mobility in combat. So we've shown that this isn't new. We've known about this for a long period of time, and yet it's still a problem. On one of our latest uh, missions in East Timor, so Australian forces went in originally as uh, peace and forces and then moved into a peacekeeping role. The loads that so Australian soldiers were carrying had a huge impact on their ability to complete their mission. In fact, the loads they were carrying allowed for the, well, they weren't insurgents then, they were belligerents or militia to adopt a shoot and scoot tactic. So they'd come up, they'd fire a few rounds at the Australians, drop their weapon, turn around and run away. Now, firstly, when they dropped their weapon and turned around and ran away, it meant we couldn't return fire because of the rules of engagement, so they say. So the only thing we then had going for us was to get them. But they knew we couldn't chase them because we loaded down with full kit, up, weighing up to around 47 and a half kilos. So if you're wearing thongs, shorts, and a light jacket, and I'm wearing body armor, helmet, Kevlar helmet, you know those old skid lids before we got good ones that rotated back and forth on your head, full pack, boots, there is no way in heck I'm going to catch you. Particularly when you've had the initiative with the initial um, you know, engagement of fire, we suddenly said, something's happened, we're going to turn around and chase you. There was no way we could catch them. So they had to change the way they were doing their operations in East Timor. And in fact, one of my friends who was out there at the time, he was one of the first to come up with an idea where the number two scout and the number two rifleman only went out in boots, body armor, two magazines, and a weapon. As soon as the shoot and scoot happened, their primary task was to chase down the person that initiated the contact. And while the rest of the, the, uh, the section and then platoon moved up to catch them. So we had to adapt what we were doing because of load. Some of the impacts that a lot of people don't realize load carriage actually has as well is the impact on marksmanship. So the ability for you to effectively suppress a target and neutralize a target. Let's face it, when you're out there and somebody's shooting back at you, you know, you'd, you'd like to be able to make sure that you can stop that, uh, which is the primary reason you're out there. So anything that decreases your ability to effectively apply rounds on target are a concern. And a lot of research has found that as soon as you put on load, it decreases your accuracy, except in one population group, which I'll talk about in a sec. We found the same sort of thing generally occurring with uh, the police, except with the tactical operators. So we've just done some research with the, the Tactical Operations Unit, which is akin to SWAT, and we found that their shooting accuracy did not decrease with load. And the only other population in the military that's been found not to have a decrease in uh, marksmanship when carrying load are Special Forces. And we'll talk about the reasons why a little bit later. But for your general soldier and your, your general even police officer, as soon as you start to carry load, your ability to put rounds effectively on target decrease, which means Either A, you, suspect, you, you expend more ammunition, which means you have to carry more ammunition, which means your load goes up, 
or B, your chance of collateral damage increases. Your ability to throw a grenade decreases. Now they found, ironically enough, there's only one research paper that actually looks at accuracy of grenade throw with low courage. They found your accuracy doesn't change that much, but your throw for distance decreases. So how far you can throw the grenade decreases. This becomes important. This is the Australian F1 fragmentation grenade. All right, so its lethal radius is within six meters. So if you're within six meters, it's, it's not going to be a very, very happy day for you. If you're within about 15 meters, there's a good chance you, you're going to take some shrapnel. There's a very, very high chance. But the danger radius goes out to within around 30 meters. And there's even a secondary fragmentation zone which can go out to about 150 meters. But realistically, if you throw this grenade, you do not want to be anywhere within 30 meters of where the thing goes bang. Now, the maximal distance that soldiers have been found to be able to throw a grenade effectively is around 40 meters. So on a good day, you've got 10 meters of fudge factor. You start to put heavy load on, the ability to throw for distance decreases. And we found it decreases even more in female soldiers. All right, and now with the, the change in Australian policy, we all have female soldiers within our infantry and on our frontline units throwing grenades pretty soon. So there's a high chance that female soldiers and even our lighter male members who are carrying these loads are going to actually be within the danger radius of the grenades they're throwing. So you've got to make sure you've got some really good effective cover or you're going to have a really bad day very quickly. Now let's put these together. <laughs> this is where it gets even worse. When you're engaged with the enemy on a two-way firing range, there's two things that will happen. You'll advance in a contact or you'll withdraw in contact. The actions you apply are technically similar. You suppress the enemy with effective fire. So effective fire means, you, you know, for us it means one round per second within one square meter of the target. So you suppress them. So you've got a group of soldiers who will suppress the belligerents while the other group of soldiers move. So now your effective fighting force becomes degraded where your soldiers can't apply effective lethal fire to suppress the enemy because their marksmanship has gone down. At the same time, while you're less effective at suppressing the people shooting back at you, the soldiers are now getting up and exposing themselves and moving slower. So you're getting a double whammy. You're letting the, you know, your opposition spend more time popping up, more time to take a beat on you, and then you're standing up for longer. If there's anything that can totally counter your effectiveness in combat, it's load. So, you know, let, let's look at some of the research, and this is where it starts to get a little bit scary when you, you, you put some of the finer detail on it. There was a great study done by Pandorf, uh, a US scientist, in uh, 2002, and he looked at the time it took for soldiers to cover a whole bunch of obstacles, but one of the obstacles was a four-step over obstacle over about 6.3 meters. And he found that their time, on average, increased by around 1.4 seconds. Now, no, 1.4 seconds when you're moving. doesn't sound like that much. But then when you consider the cyclic rate of an AK-47 is around 600 rounds per minute, if somebody sees you and opens up on full automatic, that's an extra 14 bullets coming at you. All right? That's if only one person's engaging you. If you look at some of the distances between cover in Afghanistan, and I'll actually show you some of the footage in a sec, that distance there is around six to seven meters. And this was judged off satellite, and, and you know, the DSTO guys looked at the angle of shadows and all sorts of wonderful things. But you're talking about 6.7 meters. So if they're just covering this across soft, uneven ground, they're going to be slower, which means their chances of being shot moving between cover increases. And now for the fun video. You've got to have video. So they're actually under contact. I don't know if you can actually hear it. So you could see there that, unfortunately you couldn't hear it quite well, they were actually under contact and there were rounds coming in and they were trying to, they wanted to exfil and we'll actually have a look at the exfil in, in a sec because it's, it's got its own little interesting challenges. But they had to move between that distance of cover whilst they were engaged uh, with the enemy. But you know, that was lucky. That was only a really, really short distance. Quite often you're moving a lot bigger distances. So you can see Australian soldiers traversing at the open distance and then all hell breaks loose ahead. And they're actually running as fast as they can with the load they've got on their body, whilst bullets are flying everywhere. I'll try and see if I can increase the volume for one of, the, one of these next ones. Now, the one I like about this is this is our SF guys that were in contact before between the buildings, doing the exfil, and one of them's got a helmet cam on. Notice where his vision is before he actually starts, once he gets towards the, uh, 
the airframe, which is going to uh, expel them here. You know, he, he fires a couple of range just rounds down range to suppress the enemy. But watch where his helmet is whilst he's actually trying to get back, back to cover. So it's a quick look at cover and then he's busy watching the ground so he doesn't trip and fall. And now he's covering while others move and again, you can bet that his marksmanship lethality could typically be reduced because of the loads he was carrying. Now this is one of my favorite ones because it's um, a US one, but uh, hopefully you'll be able to hear it. Um, I'll see if I can actually, there is a volume in here somewhere. What I like about this is before the US soldier actually moves, you can hear him breathing. He's already totally stuffed. He's got to move between cover while the rest of the patrol are I'm trying to maintain cover for him. And then you hear the two cracks of near misses and then he engages whilst he's running carrying this load. And you've got to wonder how combat effective this poor guy is whilst rounds are coming down range at him. Yeah. about lethality and the impact of load, so both mobility and lethality, when those start to reduce, you start to impact on combat effectiveness and you start to increase the chance that somebody's going to get shot and or uh, wounded. And I, I wish it was that, you know, that isn't even the scary bit. To me, this is the scariest bit because of some of the other research we've done which has started to back this up. We've looked at soldiers' perceptions on the impact of load carriage. So whilst they're carrying load, what do they think it does to their performance? Quite a few of them correctly identify that load carriage decreases their mobility. The, the ratio is around a, a negative 1.2 out of 2. When we looked at marksmanship and grenade throw, it went down to around 1.0, all the way down to about minus 0 0.9, the impact on their marksmanship. And some of them just said, look, you let more rounds down range. But when it came to the impact you think load carriage has on your attention to what you're doing, most soldiers rated this fairly low. They thought, oh, minus about 0.6 to 0.8, which was fairly low. So they didn't think carrying load had a big impact on their attention to task. Yet research has shown that load carriage has a huge impact on your attention to task, particularly to visual stimuli. So for your ability to take in visual information, process it, and think about what it means. All right? So for somebody on the front line, tactical operator, police officer, that could be taking in visual cues that somebody has a hidden weapon, whether it be at a vehicle checkpoint, whether it be on a boarding party. Right? Quite often the first sign that something's not right won't be them saying, I am carrying a gun, I am carrying a gun. It'll be something that you visually notice that something isn't right. So as soon as you start carrying load, your ability to take in visual stimuli and adapt to it is degraded. This is a great photo of a firefighter just before he went through the roof. So his ability to notice Signs and symptoms of a weakened structure that you're standing on is considered to be degraded because of the amount of load they're carrying. All right, and that was about a second before the whole roof gave way and he went straight down. So taking in information and doing something with it is hugely important to effectiveness. The primary cause of soldier loss of life in Afghanistan for Australian forces is the IED. All right, can anybody spot the IED? And everyone goes, oh, it's that one, it's that one. Actually, it's over there. So you're carrying all this load, and you've got to try and find signs and symptoms of an IED that's been, that's been placed in your way. I mean, can you see the IED there? And these are specialists about to pull it out of the ground. It's funny, I got this photo back from a friend of mine um, when he found out you know, I was giving one of the, these talks a couple of years ago. And he said, this soldier here, there's no way he is scanning his foreground, midground, and far ground. He's actually silently praying that he goes down with heat stress so he can just take the load off him and go back to his base. 
You know, there, there is no way you're effectively taking in good visual information, processing and then doing something with it when you're carrying these sorts of loads. And yet that's what's required of them. Now conditioning to mitigate the impact and the negative impacts of load carriage is not new. We can go back to um, General Flavius uh, Renatus who actually recommended that new legionnaire recruits conduct load carriage conditioning right, of up to 15 Roman miles per day at the fast march whilst carrying stores and sustainment to last them for a day in the field. So that was around 100 BC. We know about conditioning for load carriage. And hey, we do it in our Australian Defence Force. As you can see, we're going for a beautiful load carriage march, heavy pack, ammunition, crate because it's a bit more heavy. But you know, let, let's make it realistic and walk along this huge open fire lane because it's a nice easy road and it's safer for them to walk along. So we'll look at the research then behind you know, what's optimal for formal load carriage conditioning. And I did a paper in 2010 with a bunch of uh, co-workers and we went through all the initial literature. So we did a huge literature search and we found around 8,000 papers discussing load carriage. We then were given a, a, a further 36 or so papers from our ad, ABCA, you know, the Australian, British, Canadian and uh, American Alliance partners. And at that stage we were also involved with Five Eyes. So the French threw us across some, um, some of their stuff on the Felon project. And we, we pumped up our papers to just over around 8,089. Once you applied some exclusion criteria, like the fact that we weren't really interested in the load carriage capacity of the red ant, it dropped down to around 214 realistic papers. We implemented a secondary uh, criteria, which was, did the papers actually look at load carriage conditioning? And we dropped down to around seven papers um, with one conference paper and then four secondary source papers. And all four of those secondary source papers actually came out of Usarium, so the United States Army for Research of uh, Environmental Medicine which have done a lot of work, and particularly one man, which I'll talk about in a sec. Um, so that's the information we ended up with, and we started to say, well, okay, what does this mean? We had to get the information, and one of the biggest bugbears I have is all this research is great, but unless it's usable at the tactical level and it's the so what factor, it's just going to sit as research and it's not going to be effective. So we had to create a, a mechanism for providing an output, and for us we used the FIT formula, the old fitness formula, for frequency, intensity, time, and type. And we went through all this information and we broke it down into these categories. And we found that research recommends a frequency of one load carriage session every 10 to 14 days. So one load carriage session every 10 to 14 days. And when I was doing research on with some of the units looking at when they last carried load, we had soldiers out there who hadn't carried load in over 90 days. All right, so as soon as you put a load back on their back, and of course the brain remembers how fit and healthy they used to be, they put on the exact same load as required for the rest of the unit because they don't want to be seen to be carrying any less load and suddenly they sustain an injury. The intensity of the load. So it has to build up to that that is required on operations. It sounds simple. The last decade, when you combine both our uh, fighting order, which we call patrol order, and our emergency approach march, and our approach march, which we call uh, marching order, we carried around 40 to 50 kilograms on average over the last decade. Our average marching order actually went up to around 56.6 kilograms. So that's what we're carrying in the field on operations. So that's what we have to build up our intensity to, to be able to carry. But that's great, and you know we're pretty good at that. But we have to develop the intensity to the speeds required on the job. And most importantly, over the terrains required. So when I showed you that earlier picture of the cadets undergoing load carriage conditioning, it was on that great, nice, flat road. As we know, operations, yeah, around 50% of our uh, patrols are on flat terrain over in Afghanistan, but the other 50% are over terrain which is undulating to high or steep incline. So every 1% incline gradient that you go up, that's the equivalent of adding 10 kilograms of load to the physiological cost. Right, so yeah, we may even have the same load, which we didn't, which I'll talk about in a sec, in the backpack and on the body, but we weren't training them physiologically to meet the requirements of operations. So please remember, when we talk about intensity, it's not just how much load weight they're carrying. They've got to be moving at the same speeds. All right, so every 0.5 uh, meters per, uh, kilometers per hour change in speed is, a, again, the equivalent of 10 kilograms worth of load. So you make them go faster, you make them go up an incline, like when somebody's shooting at them, and the load impact physiologically is huge. But we didn't train that. 
the time. So again, it's got to be up to the duration of load carriage operations. And this is really one of the hardest things to sort. You only have X amount of training time and everybody, particularly before operations on your, you know, your force readiness cycle, everybody wants five cents of these, you know, of the people they're training. There's got to be briefs on this, that and everything else. And then they've got to go through all forms of weapons training and retraining depending on whether they're in the wire or out the wire, and there's more and more information they've got to do, counterinsurgency training and what happens if you're captured and the psychological impact. And hang on, there's this new change to ROs that we want to implement, and we've got to lecture you on this. So everybody wants a bit of their time, and you've got to somehow condition them in there. So if you're lucky, you get one PT session, which lasts for 60 minutes. So you've got 60 minutes of load carriage if you're lucky to prepare them to go on operations, where we've, we've had reports back of doing a 15 kilometer infill three hours on station and then a 15 kilometer exfill. But it's all right, we've trained them to carry load for one hour. So again, the conditioning back home is not meeting the operational requirements. And then the type of conditioning. So yeah, load carriage is obviously preferable. But some of the research also found that combined resistance training, and by combined I mean both upper and lower body for the purposes of the research, because they divided it into lower body only or upper body only, and they didn't really look at the nature, whether it was kinetic link or how, how much movement was involved in the exercises, but combined full body training, and some cardio may be beneficial. Now, in 1989, a really smart man by the name of Stephen Rudsky did some research on the Australian Army where when we join recruit training, we normally raise two platoons at a time, and they're called brother platoons, and they, they sort of work together. It's easier for logistics to manage, or brother and sister platoon if it's a female platoon. And ironically enough, when I joined in 1989, I happened to be in one of the platoons that was undergoing this, this research, which was the impact of load carriage versus aerobic conditioning uh, on your aerobic fitness. So our brother platoon, 14 platoon Bravo company, they did running. As part of their PT, between sessions, everything they did was running. Whereas we did no running at all. For 12 weeks of basic recruit training, we just carried packs. And what we found, or not we, I was the one carrying the pack, what Steve Rodsky found was that those that did the load carriage conditioning and those that did the running actually had the same increase in VO2 at the end. And that was measured by both the Astrand and our five kilometer run times. So the physiological cost of carrying the load had a very, very similar benefit. The one key thing that he did mention was the loads that we carried, had, that were carried, had to be sufficient enough to elicit a physiological response. But at the same time, my platoon, I'll call it my platoon now, was, was rated as having the most effective field skills whilst doing field training because they were familiar with load carriage because they've been carrying load We've, we'd had load on us all the time so everything we did was with load so the little niggles making sure that we you know had all our straps fastened correctly was second nature whereas those that had been running in PT gear all the time and every day when they put on load they were discomfort you know it was discomfortable it distracted them from what they were doing and that informal benefit was huge so don't forget there's these all these informal benefits and we'll look at some of those in a sec now, a study done after mine in 2012, and this is my idol. Uh, I don't know if any of you know Dr. Joe Napik. He is the guru of uh, low carriage research. Um, he's probably the foremost expert, I'd argue, uh, in the world at the moment on low carriage research and conditioning. He did a paper, which is a lot better than mine, in around 2012, and he looked at 11 publications, and what he ended up doing was actually delving down and creating an analysis of the, the training and the output at the end to look at the effect of uh, physical conditioning on load carriage performance. And what he found is, yeah, there's a substantial training effect on improving performance uh, with progressive resistance training and some aerobic training. And that was three sessions, four times a week over, you know, four, uh, three sessions over four weeks. He found, of course, the effects became better when you added the specificity of actually doing load carriage conditioning. So, yep, doing some basic training is great. Doing basic training and adding load carriage, even better. They also found that field-based training so whilst they're out field, if you actually get them to carry the loads required, improve their load carriage performance. Great, that makes sense. But one of the things I found when then going back through and looking at our Australian load carriage data, when we condition people to carry load, our PTIs, we're not getting them to carry more than a mean average of around 36 kilograms. Whilst going on field and doing field training exercises, which are designed to facilitate and closely approximate what we'd expect on operations, they're only carrying around 42 kilograms. And then we're sending them out on operations where they're carrying 56 and a half kilograms. 
So even our field training, we're not getting them to carry the same amount of loads. And one of the key reasons behind that was logistics. Well, you know, we've only got X amount of rations in store, so every man will carry one ration pack instead of three. And you know, we don't have enough live rounds, or we're scared you're actually going to accidentally going to shoot somebody, so we're going to give you three blank rounds, just enough for you to have an unlawful discharge and get charged, uh, and the rest, you know, when you, do a, when you do a fire movement drill, just go, you know, bread and butter, bread and butter, bread and butter, jam. Um, so they weren't actually carrying the real loads on operations, and yet, uh, in training, and then when we stuck them in field op uh, operational requirements, they had the real stuff, because it was the real thing, and they were carrying these loads. So if they are talking about field training to improve load carriage conditioning, You've got to make sure that those loads carried during field training closely approximate what you're going to expect them to carry out uh, on operation. Resistance training and aerobic training alone uh, had varying effects depending on the nature of the load carrier, more the individual. So some of the research has found that a greater upper trapezius bulk, for example, will decrease your chance of a brachial plexus palsy because the load is taken onto the, the muscle tissue as opposed to on the clavicle, which then depresses and impinges on the um, brachial plexus. So that's some of the anecdotal evidence we've got out of our physiotherapists. Um, also, if you've got a stronger core, you've got a stronger rectus spinae, your ability to withstand and carry the load and your fatigue resilience is a little bit higher. But ultimately, you need to carry load to improve at carrying load. You've also got to consider gender. So this was, uh, we stuck GPS and heart rate monitors on some of our recruits just joining. The two blue lines are our female soldiers and our two red lines are our male soldiers that we had heart rate monitors on performing the exact same march, so they're moving as a formed body. And you can see that the female heart rates, the mean heart rates, were a lot higher. Statistically significant at the Yazoo. So we're talking about less than 0 0.0001 of significance, which is fairly high. So they are working a lot harder to complete the same task. Now this is where it becomes rather interesting, because on some of these tasks, they're actually assessed as squad leaders and for our officers as platoon leaders. Right, so what we're doing is we're getting them, particularly when they go field and they're carrying the same load, we're assessing them on their performance. So when you think about it, it's like assessing one soldier on his performance while he's walking around nice and leisurely, and you're making the other one sprint as fast as possible, and you're assessing them both on their performance on how they think and take in information and give orders. So some of them are a lot more fatigued when they're being assessed, and we actually have to change our training protocol. We went to a relative body weight system and we found that this almost plateaued out and it evened out um, the assessment quite effectively. In fact, we had one female soldier at the time who was carrying 87% of her body weight on the exercise. Now this is really important, particularly for those of you that are involved in training um, for load carriage. In my earlier session today, I spoke about how the nature of culture has changed and how Typically, the people that we get, particularly out of high school, they've spent the last several years sitting down studying. They're not out, they're not moving very much anymore. We stuck GPS on them the day they stepped off their bus, and we found that the average recruit over a period of 10 days walks around 7.5 kilometres per day, just between lessons and around the area. So they're walking 7.5 kilometres per day. That excluded any drill. So marching up and down the playground, we, we cut that out. That excluded any physical training. So they've gone from doing nothing all day, every day, to suddenly getting them to walk seven and a half kilometers every day without rest, without break. And of course, then you've got culture shock. You stick them into an environment where it's communal cooking and the nutritional value is a little bit iffy, all right, for what these guys require. And suddenly we wonder why we have such an influx of lower limb injuries. Of course, then you add pack weights. You then get them to march five or 10 Ks. And then you get them to march up and down the parade ground for two or three hours in boots. All right. The nature of our population has changed, which means we have to facilitate this change. And you have to be aware of the informal impacts of your conditioning program. A similar task, uh, study was done by Joe Napick again, where they used pedometers, and they found that uh, some of the US Army recruits can walk up to about 11 Ks a day. You know, that, that's pretty huge. All right, considering the type of training, specificity. Specificity is vital, again. This is the New South Wales Police, so they go for their run training, and then of course they get out on the job. Research has shown that for every 100 gram increase in boot weight, it increases your VO2 cost by around 1%. So here we're talking about 600 gram running shoes going into boots that weigh around 1.6%, which means straight away they've decreased their oxidative capacity by around 10%. You then add a holster onto the thigh, which again decreases your VO2 for every kilogram or half to one kilogram by around 2%. So we're training like this and then we're putting them into this sort of situation. 
Only fuel source for the body is glucose and glycogen. Only fuel source for the brain, glucose and glycogen. So they become glycogen depleted and then you expect them to use good judgment at the end of this. Particularly if they're on shift where they've been going all day, every day, like the riots, or they surging, chasing down belligerents, you know, nullifying the, the threat and then doing it again and doing it again and doing it again. And then a high state of anxiety anyway, so they've got the adrenal dump when everything goes a little bit south and they, you know, they get there first and suddenly there's a force mismatch. One of them, ten of the other people who are a little bit nasty. All right, adrenal dump, sucks out the glucose and glycogen, so that gets burnt off. And then at the end of the day, we expect them to make, you know, wise decisions. It's, it's a big ask. Again, specificity. What are you training for? Will one prepare you to do the other? And we, we're not just talking about the, the actual physiological cost of carrying the load again. We're going to that informal stuff. The discomfort of wearing the load and the change it has to your posture. And how to optimize the load that you're carrying, making sure the straps are right so that you don't uh, suffer injuries that are needless, like chafing, blistering, etc. And then, of course, you've got to integrate it with everything else you're trying to do. So you can't just have this great load carriage conditioning program because they do so many other things. They've got sport. They play sport, so you've got to make sure they're well conditioned for sport, otherwise they're going to get injured. Highest cause of injuries in the Australian Defence Force in both the 2000, and f uh, 2000 uh, Defence Health Status Report and then again in the 2005 Health uh, Hansard Committee Report was physical training and sport. So we've got to do something to prevent them from being injured during sport because obviously that's having an impact on our force generation. So we've got to condition them. And then of course you've got all these other things that you've got to do. You've got to maintain happy, healthy lifestyle because you want to train a soldier for life. So it's not good having a soldier that's very combat effective for four years and then goes down with a, you know, a heart stroke or a heart, uh, a heart pathology. So you've got to maintain their cardiorespiratory health at the same time. So you have to integrate what you're doing. So you, you're looking at your individual lifestyle and healthy uh, lifestyle sort of choices where you're looking at metabolic fitness, your neuromuscular fitness, injury prevention, particularly if they've got an event coming up like a cross country, healthy lifestyle education, because let's face it, when they leave school these days, they don't have lifestyle education anymore. They don't know what is fat. I'm sure they don't because they come up to us and say, tell me how to eat right. And you go, really? You really don't know how to eat right? You really think that donut's the best thing to eat? I think they know, but they just, I don't know, they don't want to believe that the donut isn't the healthiest choice. But it's all right if it's got fruit jam in the middle, because that's your fruit for the day. Uh, and then, of course, there's personal training and fitness, because the problem we found that, yeah, we train them, you know, particularly recruits where they're forced to turn up to training, they then go to the units, and their motivation kind of goes south very, very quickly. And if they're not required to turn up for, for training, they, they stop training. So we've got to teach them how to look after themselves. Then we've got to look at the complex war fighting skills. So weapon retention, bayonet fighting, and all those other skills, self-defense. And of course, you've got to add somewhere in there the load carriage. Then you've got to prepare them for the sports that are coming up. And of course, you've got people that are injured. So they have to be reinserted back into the training continuum some way. So that's all the sort of things you've got to amalgamate your load carriage conditioning program into. Here's an example of one that we developed for the Royal Military College. Over an 18-month period, because we were lucky, again, there's an 18-month training cycle for our officer cadets. And as you can see, we marked in the capstone events, and that's that exercise shaggy ridge, which is a food and sleep deprivation exercise, where we load them up to around 47% of their body weight. Um, and it's a very, very unhappy time for them. The instructors love it. Uh, and we looked at loading for both load in terms of weight, distance, and speed of march. Now, when I first developed this, I made a, a fatal, oh, not a fatal flaw, but a flaw I'm not happy about, and that was I didn't include one thing, terrain. So then in 2009, when I realized this huge flaw, um, I actually had to go back and rewrite it and include terrain training in there as well. So I'm still learning, and I'm sure there's something else that I've missed in the, in the new version as well. But we had to update it because we, we thought of so many factors, but we still missed one of the key ones, the amount of terrain they're going across. Particularly when they get out at this end here, and some of them are deployed within six months. And we're not just talking about deployed as a, a gun number, we're talking about deployed as a platoon commander who's in charge of 31 other people. So they can't get broken. All right, informal conditioning. So you've got your formal conditioning program, you know, one every 10 to 15 days, and, or 12 to 10 days, that's great, and this is how you've got to do it, this is how much weight, and you know, your, your frequency, intensity, time type. But you can also make use of informal conditioning. So can you add load carriage to everyday tasks? Because as I said before, one of the biggest problems is time. We're all time poor. Right? You've got one hour for a PT session, if you're lucky, three times a week. 
from New South Wales Police Force, you got one hour of PT once a week. So how can we optimise your load carriage conditioning in times where you're not actually doing PT? Now, in the olden days, in our infantry battalions, we used to have a thing called um, patrol order Mondays. So every Monday, regardless of what you're doing in the unit, you wore patrol order. Whether you're a duty runner, whether you're a duty driver, whether you're doing you know, infantry minor tactics, whatever, everybody in the unit wore patrol order for the day. That was it. And that's how we got our load carriage conditioning done, so we could spend our other PT time doing other things. And of course, it had this huge carryover effect because when you are doing those everyday tasks, in operations, you're carrying load. And yet, of course, when we condition them formally, all they do is walk in a straight line carrying load. So that was one of the, the, the things that we used to have, but it went by the wayside. Why? Because, well, it's uncomfortable and it's logistics. You've got to make sure everybody's got all the gear because we normally do a DP1 uh, equipment check beforehand, make sure everybody had the equipment, then you'd all put it on and then you'd walk, wear it for the day. Well, too hard. And it started to go by the wayside. You know, people didn't really want to have to wear load during the day. And that's uncomfortable, makes you sweat through your uniform, which means you can't wear it tomorrow because you're going to have to wash it. So we've lost one of the forms of informal conditioning. One of the other things that you've got to consider as well is where else we can uh, apply it that will decrease the impact it has on those other factors, like lethality. So at the moment, the Australian Army, to requal, you have to do two shoots a year. And of course, because of budget cuts and easing logistics, we do it at a wets facility. So it's a simulated facility. We don't even have to fire lava rounds anymore. All right? And normally, our webbing, which we're supposed to wear because we're supposed to facilitate what we're going to be doing on operations, is empty. Why? Why is it empty? Because it's so much easier to do a range clearance at the end. Oh, yeah, they're all empty. Yep. You know, your range clearance is good, safe, you can go. So even though we're wearing the web webbing there, it's more show than go. And yet on operations, that's not what we're doing. So then we look at, well, what are they required to do? It's two prone shoots a year. So even if we went back to the old days where we actually used to get out to the range and the drill sergeant, you know, or our platoon commanders used to get out there and make sure you had all your load on you, we used to lie down a beautiful, pristine range, nice and clean, wash away the brass, and engage targets at your leisure. Right? And again, when we're on operations, it's not exactly what we're doing. So there's a far difference between doing that and doing this. One of the things I mentioned before, where we didn't find decreases in lethality with our special forces population and with our tactical operations unit. Why? Because they don't train like this. They don't do their shoots like this. They do it like that. And really interestingly, some of the research we've got, which is brand new, and we're still going to have to investigate what this means, is we've actually found that we've changed the way that we measure some of the shooting dynamics. We found that the tactical police, um, we, we got them to sling their primary weapon, with the M4, because they're just way too accurate with it, so there was no good data. But when they were firing their, their sidearm, we found that it, their uh, movement across the vertical, the horizontal axis decreased. They actually became more effective carrying their load. And we think one of the, we think one of the reasons is because the body armor actually helps stabilize the shoulder. So there's less translation this way. What we did find, however, which we didn't expect, is we expected a greater increase in your vertical axis because as you breathe, that impacts on your vertical axis. And we didn't find that. We think it was because it was the, the one test that we did do, or the two tests that we did do, were really anaerobic in nature. They didn't last for more than around uh, 30 to 70 seconds. So we don't think we really stressed them enough. So we'll get out there and we'll smash them around a little bit more. But for people that train carrying load, they're a lot more effective at their lethality tasks. So this is a key reason behind train as you do. Right? A key reason why we, we're using it to justify for these populations that if they're going to do a range shoot, let's load them up and let's do it properly because they're getting this informal conditioning with them. One of the key things we have to also consider is the what's next. Right? So for soldiers, it's not normally not too bad unless they're at a forward operating base. You know that if you've got them for a PT session this morning, there's a very, very low chance that suddenly they're going to have to jump out and engage the enemy within an hour. But for our tactical operators, our, our police and our firefighters, they could get called out at any minute. Right? If they call out at any minute, the last thing you want to do is physically smash them in a session, whether it be load carriage or any other form of extreme conditioning program, and then have them go out into the live theatre and have to apply their skills effectively. So you have to consider when you're going to apply this load carriage conditioning, either formal or informal, uh, during a shift cycle. Because the last thing you want to do is fatigue the these operators before they go out and have to apply their skills. So a take home message to improve load carriage performance, and more importantly to me, is to reduce the impact 
it has on your tactical performance, you need to have a formal load carriage conditioning program. Right? The program would ultimately include specific load carriage events, so you've got to get them to carry load, progressing up to the loads required, up to the duration, distances required. At least one every seven to 14 days. The reason I dropped that from seven from 10 was because of that NAPIC study that found sometimes one session per week was having just as good benefits. All right? So you really need to get people to carry load, to be effective at carrying load. But at the same time, you've got all these other things you have to consider. Like, if they're new recruits, how much walking are they going to be doing every day? Because for them, that is part of their initial load carriage conditioning, carrying their own body weight, moving their own fat butt just up and forward. It's funny, we actually caught our ADFA, our ADFA cadets, our Australian Defence Force uh, officer cadets, who are tri-service. Tri it's like a university within a military culture. They were driving to the canteen because it was 600 metres away. Right, they used to drive to the canteen because they just didn't want to walk that far. So these are sorts of things that you've got to consider, these informal things that will totally stuff up your conditioning program. If you're lucky, you have one hour to fix them and then they've got 23 hours to undo all your good work. These are some of the references that we used. Um, one of the references that I would recommend, is, it's a really good reference to use, is that one there by Joe Napick. Uh, that's a fantastic paper. Um, if you can't find it, ping me an email. I'll be happy to send it to you. Uh, there's some other good ones on history. Uh, that's a really good one. Uh, if, if you do anything with firefighters, Mays are really, and Park are really, really good. Uh, and that's more and more and more and more. All right. Uh, and that's my contact email and addresses, and I've got some business cards if anybody's really interested. <laughs>